Arsenic has a storied history full of mysterious poisoners and sometimes less than sympathetic victims. In everyday life, it served as rat poison, medicine, makeup, and more. But for thousands of years, it's also been used to bring an excruciating death to countless people. Arsenic has a very long history. Since the time of the Romans, it has been used to settle old scores, knock off spouses, and execute criminals. Arsenic poisoning was popular for several reasons, but chief among them was that it left very little trace. The symptoms of arsenic poisoning, vomiting and diarrhea, were easily mistaken for other common diseases, such as food poisoning or cholera. Arsenic could both be used to kill quickly or slowly. As a London newspaper reported in 1855, if you feel a deadly sensation within and grow gradually weaker, how do you know you are not poisoned? Arsenic was a silent killer, and it was usually used by people very close to the victim. A wife, a son eager to acquire his inheritance, or even a disgruntled servant. Yeah. Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me here again today. Last week we spoke about the Musi Madondo case and how a South African who had some fantastic opportunities abroad flipped and tragedy struck. So I will link that up here if you have not seen that video. But today we are talking about a case that I stumbled upon and it is not a South African case but it is still fascinating nonetheless. And I was watching something on Netflix and they started talking about how women have historically poisoned more than men used poison back in the day. And I was quite fascinated by this. And I went down a rabbit hole and I found a lady who was apparently England's first female serial killer. And on this channel, we have spoken about a female serial killer before, back in the day, and a South African version of this named Daisy DeMalka. And I'll also put that as a link up here if you would like to have a look at it. But today we are going back in time where poison was more of a common way for people to kill if they wanted something untraceable and barely even looked for back in the day. And yes, as we said earlier, our suspect today is a woman. So with that being said, let's get into today's case. Intended for mature audiences only. Today we are taking a trip to the beautiful England, specifically Low Morsley where a young girl was born on the 1st of October, 1832, and she was named Mary Ann Robson. Her dad's name was Michael, and her mom's name was Margaret, and they were a working-class house, and everything that you wanted in this house, you needed to work really hard for. Michael worked in a coal mine, and Margaret stayed home to look after the kids. Margaret had another baby girl with Michael, but sadly she passed away as an infant. And then, when Mary Ann was three years old, her parents had a baby boy named Robert. So with mining and working in the coal mines back in the day, this was no grand luxurious job. Michael Robson would generally work on a contractual basis, so he would generally wait a year at one town and then he would move to another town, pursuing working as a coal miner in another town again. But I guess luckily as a coal miner and your family, when you got a job as a coal miner, you would be contracted a house. And this house was definitely the basic type of house you could get. It wasn't very sanitary. And as soon as you left, another family would move in. The Robsons were a God-loving family and they were at church every single Sunday. The Robsons were also very well regarded by the communities whenever they moved and they were very well loved by a lot of people. Then in 1842, Michael Robson was busy at work, he was back in the coal mines, and one of the little pulley systems that was used to bring the coal back to the surface, that got stuck. So now with one of the pulley systems being stuck, the whole operation was now at a halt, and Michael was asked to please try and fix this pulley system so that they could bring the coal back up to the top. So as Michael Robson is trying to repair this pulley system, sadly the rope broke, and the entire pulley and Michael fell 45 meters where Michael then fell to his death down the mine shaft. Now, this next part I feel is a true testament of how fragile life was back then and now, but how incredibly people were so nonchalant about death as well. Because Michael Robson's body was brought back to his family, but it was brought back in a wheelbarrow and his body was stuffed into one of those sacks that the coal was placed into when they brought it to the surface. And he was just brought back in a sack on a wheelbarrow 
And when the other coal miners got to the house with Michael's body, they also said like, Michael's dead now and his contract ended when he passed away. And this house was part of Michael's contract. So you also have to move out of the house. Now, those obviously aren't the exact words, but the house was contracted to Michael's job. So the family had to leave as well. They had to bury Michael and then they had to get out. So times were incredibly tough back then. Now, when Michael was being brought by the wheelbarrow by his workmate, Mary Ann was nine years old at the time that she saw her dad like this. And Margaret, Mary's mother, needed a way to support her and her brother. So she told Mary Ann that she needed to go out and find work. And she either had to beg, borrow, steal or find another job. So for a couple of months, Mary did find a job working with buttons and small things where she could use her hands. But not long after Michael Robson had passed away, Margaret Robson had actually remarried another man named George Stott. George Stott was also a minor and Mary Ann and George really didn't get on at all. He was an incredible disciplinarian and he was also a very religious man who would often lash out at Mary Ann if she didn't do what he thought was required of her. So Mary knew that she wanted out and as soon as she turned 16 years old, she then left her the house where George and her mother stayed and she then went to work as a nursing maid at a very wealthy household. Mary Ann then went to a nearby village of South Petten and then worked at the home of Edward Potter, a manager at the same mine that Mary's father had worked and died in. When Mary worked for Edward, he would note how beautiful Mary was and he really said that she was tall, slender, she was pale of complexion, but she had very caring and beautiful eyes. Mary Ann, like I said, worked as a nursemaid for Edward, and Edward had 12 children, and Mary was expected to cook, to clean, to feed, as well as to watch and play with the children. She was also required to make sure that all the fires in the home were lit and that the home was warm at all times. So this job was incredibly demanding, the days were very long, and there was very little pay, but Mary was living at the house, so she was able to save some money. But while working here as well, it really opened Mary's eyes to see what she could potentially have if she had a lot of money. But being a nursemaid is only viable for so long because the children do end up growing up. So by the time that all of the children had been sent to boarding school in Darlington, over the next three years, she returned to her stepfather's home to be with her mom and brother. And by the time that Mary actually returned to live home with her stepfather and her mother and her brother, Mary actually got on very well with George and they became very close. And she actually called George her father, not her stepfather. And while Mary was actually living with them, she learned how to become a dressmaker. Mary Ann would teach at the Sunday school and she would teach the children at the Sunday school. And she was a very devout Christian. Now, when Mary was 19 years old, she married a man named William Mowbray. And William Mowbray at the time was 15 years older than Mary was. Mary and William got married on the 18th of July, 1852. And they actually got married in court. And everyone in the town thought that this was incredibly suspicious because Mary Ann was a very devout Christian. She was very religious. So why would Mary get married in court? Why didn't she get married in the eyes of God at church? So this was a big scandal back in the day. And everyone in town thought that Mary and William were pregnant and that she had had sex before marriage. But once William and Mary Ann were married, they moved away and far away. I don't think I mentioned, but William Mowbray was actually a coal miner as well. So William and Mary Ann then moved to Plymouth and William would then work on the railroads and Mary was required to stay at home. Mary Ann and William stayed in Plymouth for five years and these five years were incredibly traumatic and devastating as well as incredibly happy for the Mowbray family. And I say it was devastating and happy in the same sentence because Mary and William had five children in the five year period. But devastatingly, four out of their five children had passed away. And yes, you could say that infant mortality was a lot more common back in the day. But I don't think that the trauma of losing your child like that for a mother or a father would ever go away or be any different just because it was more commonplace. So it was really tough for this young couple. But then in 1857, William and Mary Ann moved back home to Mary Ann's mother's house where she then moved with her child, who was one years old at the time, named Margaret Jane. 
William got a job very quickly because he was a coal miner and coal mining was booming back then. But while Mary was living back with her stepfather and her mother, she kind of felt a sense of normality and comfort because it was like she was back when she was a child. But while living back at home, Mary and William had another baby and they had another baby named Isabella. And Isabella was born in 1858 and this happy family was now a family of four. But this family of four didn't last very long and sadly, Soon after Isabella was born, Margaret Jane would pass away of scarlet fever. And when Margaret Jane had passed away, Mary Ann had found out that she was pregnant with another baby. And nine months later, another baby girl was born. And Mary then named this baby after her child that had just passed, Margaret Jane. Then another year later, William and Mary Ann had another baby. And this baby was a boy who they named Robert William. But sadly, Robert would pass away one year later from diarrhea complications. After this, a lot of people who knew Mary said that she completely changed. Mary Ann was incredibly disconnected, very cold. People around her also said that Mary Ann said that she actually lost count of how many babies she had lost in this time period. And William was now taking jobs anywhere that he could. He was working on the railroads, then he became a coal miner again, and then he got a fireman's position. So he was constantly changing jobs, which meant that he was constantly moving Mary and the two children around. But then in January of 1865, William was booked off of work because he had a very injured foot. And things just got worse from there because he came home with an injured foot, but then was bedridden with a very sore stomach. Marianne desperately tried to look after her very sick husband, but sadly William passed away from diarrhea and after 13 years of marriage, Mary was left alone with her two children. But luckily, William was insured and Mary was able to claim £35 from the insurance company and £35 at the time was around half a year's salary, so it was a lot of money for Mary and her children. Mary Ann then chose to use the insurance money and move her two children out of father and mother's home and they moved to a different town. And now that Mary Ann was actually widowed, she was allowed to work and what she chose to do was she chose to make dresses and she would then hang them outside of her house on the balcony and it was the job of Isabella, her now seven-year-old daughter, to try and sell these dresses. But Mary Ann and her children lived in a lower income area and selling dresses of this extravagance that Mary was opting for was not really working and she was only getting a sale every now and then. So she decided that this actually wasn't substantial or sustainable for her. But while Mary Ann and her two children were living in this new town, she noticed and fell head over heels for a married man named Joseph Natrus. But sadly, while she was trying to love it up with Joseph, this married man, her daughter, Margaret Jane, became incredibly ill, fell bedridden quite quickly and passed away of the same sickness of her sister before, Margaret Jane. It was said that Mary Ann couldn't deal with the trauma and having to deal with Isabella as well. So she said to Isabella that she needs to go and stay with her step-grandfather and her grandmother. And so she was sent off to live with them. Mary Ann was now 33 years old and she had lost her husband and seven children by this time and she had been through a lot but to make matters even worse her love interest Joseph Natrus now moved away with his wife to another town so she was left completely alone but while in this new town Mary Ann worked as a nurse and she absolutely loved it. Nurses were very respected at the time and it paid hardly anything but she was seen as a hero in her community. But while being a nurse, she met another man named George Ward. George Ward was illiterate and Mary Ann and George got married seven months after they had just met and George Ward was an engine driver at the time. But soon after Mary Ann and George were married, he said that he complained of a lot of tingling fingers, sore tummy and very weak limbs and the doctors were constantly in and out trying to save George from the sickness but they couldn't really find what was wrong with him. But because George couldn't work, Mary and George were getting some type of lump sum from the company just so that they could sustain themselves through the month. But this was hardly any money at all. Sadly, after 15 months of being married in October 1866, George Ward had passed away from cholera and typhoid fever. And once again, Mary Ann had made sure that she took out life insurance on her husband so she was okay for now. Then after George had passed away, Mary Ann had got a cleaning job at a shipbuilder's home and his name was James Robinson. James Robinson's wife had just passed away and he was left with five children and one which was still an infant. 
But only one day after Mary had just arrived at the property, James's infant son had passed away, apparently of convulsions. James, the shipbuilder, was absolutely distraught. And Mary Ann, being a nursemaid and a trained nurse, she gave James, the shipbuilder, an incredible amount of comfort and love and made sure that she would support him in any way possible. And soon after this, Mary Ann and James became quick lovers. Mary Ann quickly took charge of the household like she owned it, but everything then turned on its head when Mary discovered that she was pregnant. Mary had to leave because apparently her mom was quite ill and she was trying to recover from hepatitis. So pregnant Mary left James and his four now remaining children alone and she then went to aid her sick mother. By the time that Mary Ann had arrived back home, her mom Margaret was actually on the mend and she was trying to stand up by herself now. She was eating a lot and she was regaining her strength quite well. But with Margaret being and feeling better, she started noticing that things were going missing in the home and she actually caught Mary Ann in the act taking something from the home and Margaret confronted her and told her and asked her why are you stealing what do you think you're doing and then nine days after Mary Ann had arrived back home to see her mother Margaret passed away and Margaret was around 54 years of age so George Scott Mary Ann's stepfather was not impressed with how Mary Ann treated Margaret in her dying days and he was really not impressed with who Mary Ann had, had turned out to be so he told Mary Ann that he's no longer looking after Isabella she must take Isabella and go back to James, the shipbuilder, and don't ever come back here again. That was the last time that he ever spoke to Mary Ann. And when Mary Ann arrived back home to James's house, there was a lot of tension because now she had young Isabella in hand. And in the beginning, when James first found out that Mary Ann was pregnant, he absolutely refused to marry her. She was running the house. She was taking all the money. She was making sure the money was in certain areas. But James soon started noticing that money he asked Mary Ann to drop off at the bank had apparently gone missing and he was red with anger and rage and he confronted Mary Ann and he told her, why are you stealing from us? You are taking food and water out of the mouths of my children. And then mysteriously, just after Mary Ann and James had this argument, two of James's children passed away. And sadly, in the same week that two of James's children passed away, Isabella also passed away from diarrhea and Mary was given five pounds for Isabella's death by the insurance company. But then in the summer of 1867, Mary was incredibly pregnant and James could see this. He knew what the community was going to think. So he begrudgingly agreed to marry Mary Ann. They then got married and their daughter, Margaret Isabella, was born in November that year. But sadly, Margaret Isabella passed away in February the next year in 1868, also from convulsions. But then in the middle of 1868, Mary became pregnant again with James's child. And Mary Ann and James then had a baby boy together. And as soon as this baby was born, Mary Ann said, we need to get life insurance on him. It is really important to do and James was like, I'm not taking life insurance out of my child. Stop asking me this. So Mary and her son, who was named George now, who she had with James, she and George went away for the weekend. And as soon as James knew that Mary was leaving and that she had left, he then boarded up the entire household and then took his two remaining children and then left to live with his sister. When Mary had found out that James had boarded up the household, she left George with a neighbor and said she's coming back, but she never did. So eventually George was reunited with his dad and his two other siblings. And I think that this was a saving grace for James, the shipbuilder and his three children because they escaped from Mary Ann and Mary Ann and James never spoke again. And this is possibly what saved their lives. But now Mary Ann was alone, destitute. She had nowhere to go, but she eventually found work at a laundromat where she met another lady named Margaret, clearly a very popular name back in the time. But she met another lady named Margaret, who was talking about how she was quite ill. Mary Ann would say that Margaret was one of her only, if not the only person she could trust back then. And when Margaret and Mary Ann became closer and closer, Margaret then confided in Mary Ann that she wanted to leave behind £60 for her brother Frederick, who had just lost his wife and was a widow. Mary Ann was very concerned about Margaret's ill health actually. She was actually quite nice about Margaret's ill health and she did try and look after her. But Margaret wanted to introduce Mary Ann to her widowed brother, Frederick Cotton. Frederick Cotton had lost his wife and was left with two children. And because Margaret and Frederick were siblings, Mary Ann would see a lot of Frederick. And sadly, Margaret 
Frederick's sister would end up passing away. And yes, she did leave the 60 pounds to Frederick. And soon after Margaret had passed away, Mary Ann felt pregnant. When Frederick found out that Mary Ann was pregnant, Frederick was incredibly angry. He was not impressed at all. And he actually told Mary Ann to leave. And he kicked her out of the house. And Mary Ann then became a cleaner at another man's house. But like we said, Mary Ann was pregnant and she was getting bigger and bigger as the weeks were rolling on. So she was no longer able to work at this person's house cleaning. So she then returned to Frederick's doorstep and knocked on the door. Frederick was not interested in speaking to her. Two of their friends then convinced Frederick and Mary Ann to reconcile. And Frederick and Mary Ann married on the 17th of September 1870. And Robert Robson Cotton was born after they were married. So now we all think that all is well. However, we know it's not going to be. And remember that man I spoke about right in the beginning, Joseph Natras, who was Mary Ann's lover, but he was married and he moved away with his wife. Apparently, Mary Ann heard through the grapevine that Joseph Natras has now just become a widow. His wife had just passed away and he was now in the same town as Mary Ann and Frederick were. So Mary Ann tried to convince Frederick really, really well that they needed to move into the specific area of this town. And eventually she convinced Frederick Cotton, her husband, to move into the same street as her ex-lover Joseph Natras. Frederick Cotton actually didn't really notice much. He was too busy working at the cotton mines and around 11 months after they first got married and when Mary Ann and Frederick just moved to this new street near Joseph Natras, Frederick mysteriously started getting really bad stomach cramps. But then, tragically, one year after Frederick Cotton and Mary Ann got married, he passed away and doctors said that he passed away from typhoid fever. And of course, Mary Ann had made sure that she had taken out insurance money on her late husband. But Mary was stuck with Frederick's two children from his previous marriage, as well as her and Frederick's child, Robert. So Mary then decided that Joseph and the trust needed to move in with her as a lodger. And basically, Joseph and Mary Ann lived as a couple within the household, but pretended to be lodgers when they left the household. By the time that 1872 had rolled along, Mary Ann's baby that she had with Frederick had sadly passed away. And one of Frederick's children that he had from his previous marriage had also passed away. Apparently, both children passed away from diarrhea. However, around two weeks after the babies had just passed away, Joseph Natras mysteriously also started getting ill. And he would get stomach cramps and he would be vomiting a lot and he would be really, really sick. And when the doctors came to try and aid him and help him, he pulled the doctor in really, really tightly. And he said, listen, this is no fever. She's done something to me. And in a really sick and twisted thing that Mary Ann did, apparently, it was reported that Mary Ann had put one of the babies who had passed away in Joseph's bedroom, right where he could see the baby, because she wanted to save on burial costs. And this was a kind of sick reminder of what possibly could happen to him. And sadly, he did end up passing away. So this meant that three deaths happened all within the same month. Now, someone named Thomas Riley, who worked in welfare, noticed that the only surviving Cotton child named Charles Cotton was really being neglected by Mary Ann. And Thomas Riley was really worried about Charles's welfare. Thomas Riley kept asking Mary Ann, do you need help? Can we help you with Charles? Do you need some money from the community? And she said, oh no, don't worry about that. He will go like the rest of the Cottons did. And sure enough, Mary Ann pretty much kept her promise. And around three days after Thomas Riley had asked about Charles's well-being, Charles mysteriously passed away of diarrhea and he was incredibly, incredibly sick. When Thomas Riley heard about Charles Cotton's death, he immediately went to the police. They really need to look at Charles's body and try and find if anything suspicious happened. So they did. The police did. They performed an autopsy on the table inside Mary Ann's house and they didn't find anything in Charles's body. But the coroner found this entire thing very suspicious. So he made sure that he kept the stomach contents of Charles when he was being autopsied on the lounge table in Mary Ann's home. But nothing suspicious was found and Charles was laid to rest. But when news spread about Thomas Riley apparently thinking that something suspicious happened with Mary Ann, the newspapers caught wind of a story and they thought that there was something in this. So they started digging up Mary Ann's history. They found that Mary Ann had lost a total of three husbands, 11 children, 
her mother and her friend Margaret. The doctor who performed the autopsy was suspicious about hearing of all these deaths, so he remember kept the stomach contents of Charles and conducted more tests. In conducting the tests, he found the presence of arsenic. And because of this, Mary Ann Cotton was arrested and charged with Charles Cotton's murder. Mary Ann Cottons was arrested one week after Charles Cottons' murder, and she was arrested in her home on the 18th of July, 1872. The two babies who had just passed away, as well as Joseph Matruss, their bodies were all exhumed, and all of them contained extreme amounts of arsenic using minuscule amounts of arsenic over a period of months until it built up in the victim's system and shut down their organs. In fact, a pea-sized amount was all it took. It was also odorless and tasteless, so it was very easy to conceal in food or wine. As arsenic London, was pretty popular in the 1800s. So popular, in fact, it is believed that a third of all criminal cases of poisoning from that era involved arsenic. It's easy to believe because back then, arsenic was available in any chemist shop, sold as a rat poison, and was relatively inexpensive. Its popularity led to a wave of high-profile trials for arsenic poisoning, most of which accused women. During the 19th century, arsenic was available everywhere, and it was very inexpensive. It's no wonder that in 1851, the House of Lords in England tried to pass a law making it illegal for women to buy arsenic. That now, the reason that most doctors thought that Mary Ann's victims passed away of typhoid fever was because arsenic poisoning and typhoid fever is very similar in the sense that you either get cramps, you get diarrhea, you show symptoms of high fever, pain, sweating, and often a lot of cramping. But Mary maintained her innocence, and the trial of Mary Ann Cottons began on the 5th of March, 1873, and so many people came to see the trial. The trial took one week, and in sentencing, the jury took only one hour to deliberate, and they came back and found her guilty of murdering Frederick Cotton's son, Charles Cotton. And Mary Ann Cottons was sentenced to death by hanging. Mary Ann Cottons was hanged at Durham County Jail on the 24th of March, 1873. She died, not from her neck breaking, but by strangulation caused by the rope being rigged too short, possibly deliberately. When thinking of the children and the husbands and the friends that Mary Ann had murdered, this is an incredibly cruel way to go because it's slow, it's painful, and it's deliberate. And especially thinking about those babies that Mary had murdered, you know that when you murdered those babies and you put the arsenic in their milk or whatever you gave them, that when they were crying, you knew exactly what the outcome was going to be. Now that is the case of Mary Ann Cotton, dubbed the first English female serial killer. Let me know what you think of this case down below. Please stay safe out there. Make sure you're watching and making your own food. But I hope you all have a great week further. Thank you for all your love and support. And I'll see you again next week. Bye.